Good morning, everybody, or wherever you are. It could be afternoon or evening, but I wanted to welcome you to today's webinar, Floating Offshore Wind Systems of Tomorrow. My name is Alex Lemke, and I'm really excited to be part of NREL's ongoing Wind Energy Science Leadership Series that includes presentations and discussions on wind energy related topics, featuring speakers from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, in some cases academia, and our industry partners. These webinars will discuss the challenges facing wind energy and the pathways forward for making wind one of the most prevalent energy sources of the future. Today, we begin with a panel of some of NREL's senior research engineers to discuss the research needed to design and optimize innovative floating wind systems that will enable the deep cost reductions necessary for the commercialization of offshore wind. But before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. First, today's webinar will be recorded and available on demand and will be posted on NREL's website shortly after the webinar today. Please mute your lines and make sure your cameras are off unless you're speaking. Next, we encourage you to use the chat feature to ask questions and we'll be answering those questions at the end of the session. If we do not get to your questions during today's webinar, we will be sure to follow up with you afterward. And finally, I would like to introduce Nate McKenzie from the United States Department of Energy's Wind Energy Technologies Office to say a few words before we begin. Nate. Thank you, Alex. I'm the technology manager for offshore wind R&D here at the Wind Energy Technologies Office, or WIDO. I joined WIDO earlier this year on the first day of quarantine. I'm a naval architect coming over from the contractor side at the Office of Naval Research, where I worked on a variety of sea basing and energy projects. And prior to that, I spent a good bit of time at a shipyard working on naval ship design. At WeSearch, at WIDO, research into floating wind is a top priority. Floating wind offers a tremendous opportunity to cost effectively harness a reliable energy source. The floating space is nascent with several demonstration projects and a wide variety of concepts. As such, we see a wide a need, a strong need for significant research across a variety of technical areas. These include platform and turbine design and assessment tools, development of controls, which can include platform motions and full wake uh, effects for the whole farm, and understanding of the wind behavior across the marine boundary layer. The team at NREL is critical to making progress against these priorities, and I'm delighted to be able to work with an extremely capable group of engineers and scientists, and the four that we'll be presenting to you today are some of the best. Amy Robertson, Jason Yonkman, Garrett Barter, and Sinu Sirnivas from NREL are leading key research in floating platform tool development, system engineering, aerodynamics, and platform design. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amy. Thanks, Nate. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Robertson, and I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and I'll be moderating this webinar on the floating wind systems of tomorrow. In addition to myself, you'll be hearing from three other speakers today, including Jason Yonkman, Garrett Barter, and Sunu Cernovas, who are all senior researchers here at NREL. The purpose of this panel is to introduce you to the floating wind research that is being done at NREL that will help pave the path to its commercialization. I'll first give a bit of an overview, uh, overview of why we are studying floating wind and what our overarching research focus is. And then the three speakers will provide details on some of the more prominent research areas. So why are we pursuing offshore wind? Well, this map of the US shows what the wind speeds are on, on land and offshore and indicates that in general, the winds offshore are stronger, but they're also less turbulent and more consistent. Building wind turbines in the water means that you'll be less encumbered by transportation and construction constraints, which will enable the turbine size to grow and can help to reduce cost. You'll also be close to the largest population centers in the U.S., and you'll provide economic benefits to those coastal states, revitalizing ports and adding new jobs. Most offshore wind turbines in the world today are what we call fixed bottom designs, where the support structure for the wind turbine is built to the seafloor. Uh, here you can see a couple of the examples of these uh, types of systems, including the monopile and four-legged jacket, which are the most prominent designs being built today. But in the U.S. and other places in the world, a lot of the offshore wind regions are in water depths where it starts to become too costly to build a system all the way to the seafloor. And that threshold is considered to be commonly around about 60 meters. 
For the U.S., 58% um, of the offshore wind development areas are in these deeper water depths, as you can see here with the delineation between the darker uh, for the deeper water and the light blue for the shallower water. For these deep water regions, wind turbines are needed that float on the surface of the water and are tethered to the seafloor using mooring lines and anchors. Here we see the three general archetypes of floating wind designs, um, which are categorized by the way that they stabilize the system to keep it from tipping over during wind and wave excitation. These structures closely resemble those used in the oil and gas industry, but these design approaches at present are too costly for the competitive uh, wind energy market. New floating wind system designs are needed that push beyond these traditional designs to find ways to lower the cost of the system. At present, floating wind is at a commercial pre-commercial stage of development, and here you can see the evolution it's taken over the years. Um, starting in about 2009 to 2016, a number of one-off uh, one demonstration projects were developed, which was able to show the feasibility of floating wind as a technology. Um, we're now in what we call a pre-commercial stage where small multi-unit um, farms are being built, including the Equinor Highwind Scotland farm with five turbines and the Windfloat Atlantic with three turbines. But the next big step is to get to full commercialization, commercialization where we have large wind farms of about 400 megawatt, um, megawatts and plus. To get there, we need to overcome the hurdles of getting the cost on par with land-based systems, developing the industrial industrialized infrastructure, and also addressing the social and environmental issues. So NREL is working to address these issues to achieve floating wind commercialization in three fundamental areas. The first focus area is developing a suite of tools and methods for floating wind design, which can be used to search for optimal solutions that will lower cost. These tools incorporate the ability to characterize the meteorological and oceanographic conditions offshore, which we shorten here to MedOcean. Um, their, their loads and the structures and their power output and their associated costs. We are also developing tools to help to optimize these design solutions. Uh, today, Jason and Garrett are going to be presenting on these tools and the topic areas they'll be discussing are, are highlighted here in these lighter blue colors. Another critical area of research is the verification and validation of these tools, which is needed to ensure their accuracy to enable optimization and the development of experimental methods and measurements to acquire the data needed. The, the foundational support of this research comes from the Department of Energy's Wind Energy Technology Office, and their mission is to advance the scientific knowledge to enable clean, low-cost wind energy options nationwide. The folded list on this slide and the next two show some of the DOE-funded projects NREL is working on in these areas. The second research focus area is technology innovation, where we use the developed tool sets to explore innovative pathways that most effectively lower cost. Today, Sanu is going to be talking about the work, some work on the area of floating substructure design, again, colored here in light blue. But our work also looks at large turbine design and floating wind control methods, both at the turbine and farm level. Uh, sensitivity analyses are used to assess the impact of trade-offs in different design approaches and regional conditions to help us understand the impact of, on the entire system. Uh, this allows us to identify what components most affect cost and how to combine them to achieve a pathway that provides optimal system cost reduction. We're also starting to do work in the operation and maintenance uh, space where we're looking to develop methods that are specifically applicable to floating wind designs. Uh, the final area we focus on is the adoption of floating wind technology. Uh, the work at NREL in this area includes resource assessment, uh, which assesses the amount of wind energy available in our offshore wind regions, as shown here in the, this map. Uh, then the grid, where we work to coordinate and develop and vet a strategy for the integration of floating wind into the U.S. infrastructure. Environmental and social acceptance, which includes the SEER project mentioned here. Workforce development, where we examine offshore wind workforce needs and skills and develop curricula for K-12 education. And finally, the development of standards for the installation of floating wind technology in U.S. waters. But in addition to the funding we get from WIDO, um, NREL performs floating wind research through other funding mechanisms as well. 
One is through the Department of Energy's National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium, which hosts um, a, a number of competitive so solicitations for offshore wind research. Uh, the NOW RDC is focused on building connections between the research and industrial communities to produce innovations that directly address near-term challenges to the advancement of offshore wind in the U.S. This is a bit different than the WIDO work we are showing on the previous slides, which is focused on more long-term research goals. This slide shows some of the funding areas in the first round of awards, where seven of the 20 projects awarded were focused on floating wind, including topics like wind farm control optimization, advanced mooring design, and the development of a national offshore wind resource data set. Another research program coming out of the RPE arm of the Department of Energy is the Atlantis program, which is focused on using control co-design to achieve more optimized floating wind designs. Uh, the controller on wind turbine will tell the blades to pitch, the turbine to yaw, or changes the rotational speed to try to maximize power while not overtaxing the system. But when on a floating platform, these actions can excite dynamics into the, into the system, which can lead to instability issues. But this ability to impose dynamic excitation can also be used to improve the stability of the system, which could allow for smaller, more lightweight designs. A controller co-design approach means that you're integrating the controller as a fundamental component in the wind turbine design process rather than developing it after the design is already fixed. Atlantis includes a series of projects that are looking at developing the computer tools to enable controls co-design, experiments to validate these tools, and the exploration of radically new floating designs based on these capabilities. At NREL, we're leading a project um, in each of these areas, including US Float in Area 1, Weiss in Area 2, and the Focal Project in Area 3. A lot of the research at NREL, that NREL performs so in coordination with a larger international research community through the International Energy Agency, which is focused on advancing wind energy deployment by bringing together a global network of researchers and policy experts. There are a total of 17 active research projects right now in IA Wind, and four of these at least have some focus on floating wind. Uh, those include uh, Task 2026, which is focused on the cost of wind energy. Task 28 focused on social acceptance for offshore wind. Task 30, which performs the verification and validation of offshore wind modeling tools. Task 37 focused on system engineering, which has also created just recently a 15 megawatt floating wind reference model. And then a future task that's being developed presently that will focus on floating array challenges. NREL also supports the adoption of offshore wind in the U.S. through support of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. BOEM is the one that oversees the leasing of offshore wind development sites off the U.S. coastlines. To support BOEM, NREL has updated floating wind cost predictions in California, as well as working on lease area delineation and outreach and education in California, and other analysis work in Oregon and Hawaii as well. NREL has also been leading the development of the U.S. design standards for offshore wind, including a working group specifically focused on floating wind. Finally, in addition to the government-based funding, NREL works directly with industry partners to help bridge the gap from basic science to commercial application. This direct engagement allows NREL to help accelerate innovation and the commercialization of floating wind in the U.S. Here you can see some of the part partners that we work with in offshore wind. So hopefully that presentation has provided you some insight into the vast research NREL is doing in floating wind to help push it towards commercialization. Um, our next three speakers will provide some more detail on some of these research areas. And so now I'll hand it over to Jason Yonkman. Thank you, Amy. So I'm going to continue on the discussion uh, with a focus on wind turbine uh, modeling. Uh, first of all, I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at NREL, have been, been here for about 20 years now. I actually got my PhD uh, studying the dynamics of floating wind turbines back in 2007 and lead our uh, numerical modeling work for engineering applications to floating wind. I also support the uh, development of international design requirements, particularly the IEC, design standard for uh, floating wind. Move that out of the way here. Uh, 
So first of all, when we talk about modeling, uh, because the main goal, of course, is to develop advanced new energy technology. And the pathway to doing that through modeling is to basically de develop models that, that are based on, first of all, international design requirements like the IEC design standards, or as well as the local uh, jurisdiction requirements. Of course, you have to base the design of technology on uh, the physics, the fundamental physics of, of, uh, of the motion and, and loading of the turbine. Any sort of unique technology innovations that come to play, uh, say here, here a partial span weight pitch or some novel floating system, you need to capture the right physics of those systems in these tools to enable their design. Because uh, typically we need to run thousands of load case simulations and when we do technology development, uh, we can't run uh, full up high performance computing solutions uh, and we can't solve the problem fully with test data. However, both of those uh, really feed into the development of these tools to advance technology. Uh, and once you have tools, uh, they can really be applied for a range of technology solutions, uh, including uh, novel rotor concepts, uh, novel sensors and actuations. Uh, there's a whole transition uh, within NREL to focus on not just individual turbine uh, technology, but also design at, at the full plant level, including the active control. Uh, and then, of course, things like novel drivetrains, towers, and all these floating support structures that we've been talking about today. When we talk about floating wind, uh, one thing that's very critical is the coupled nature of the problem. So these are large uh, structures, basically as large as civil engineering structures like skyscrapers. However, they're active uh, machines that have you know, basically a brain inside a control system that interacts uh, with the environment. So of course we have the wind loading, aerodynamic loading of the structure uh, and it responds uh, structurally to that. Because it's now installed on a floating platform, we also have the dynamics of the floating system and station keeping system, as well as of course the hydrodynamic loads that impact. And it's really the couple nature of this problem uh, that makes uh, floating wind uh, challenging, but also quite exciting. I summarize here some of the, the modeling challenges we, we face when we talk about floating wind. Uh, first of all, uh, large order effects is, is a major uh, concern, uh, particularly as we go to uh, uh, from sort of pre-commercial stage now to full. We expect turbines to get much larger than they are now. Uh, so nowadays, with, with units you know, sub 10 megawatt, uh, turbine designs on the drying board are, are uh, you know around 14 megawatts, and then uh, in, in the research community, we're looking at you know the 15 megawatt turbine through IEA Task 37, as well as larger turbines such as 20 megawatts. And these turbines, you know, are, are not the same as we had before. The spatial variability of the inflow can be very dramatic. And uh, and to make sure they're cost effective, we need to make them light, and that makes them flexible. And so the interaction uh, there is quite important. Floating wind also presents some quite unique uh, hydrodynamic challenges. Uh, floating structures tend to look like uh, structures that, that have been designed for oil and gas platforms like the semi TLP and SPAR that Amy showed. However, we have to keep in mind that they're not really oil and gas platforms. Uh, first of all, they're quite a bit smaller uh, and that makes some of the, the hydrodynamic uh, theory that's been used to develop them uh, only semi applicable. So we have potential flow uh, as well as viscous effects that are, that are important. Also, these systems can be much more compliant and move more than a oil and gas platform could. Dynamic stability is an important consideration. Uh, so normally you design structures, of course, it has to be floating uh, stable, uh, but because of the dynamic nature of the floating wind problem, treating the stability in the dynamic sense is also quite important. Another big area is simply the coupled nature of the turbine with its environment. So the of course, the, the rotor has an impact on the, the floater response, but the floater response also has an impact on the rotor effect. And that can impact, say, how the, the rotor interacts with its wake um, and say how the wakes are generated in, in a wind farm. The concern that we have, uh, particularly uh, off the US, uh, Gulf of Mexico and East Coast locations is tropical cyclones. Uh, and there's, this presents certainly unique challenges in terms of uh, extreme wind conditions um, as well as extreme wave conditions and what happens when those things come through. We want to make sure that the systems in the end are cost effective, uh, but also reliable. Uh, finally, another major challenge is simply the, the huge probabilistic design space that we have. Normally we have to consider, of course, a range of wind conditions. You, you have the operational cases as well as parked and idling cases. Uh, but you also have to consider the range of wave conditions and then the directionality between them. I and mean, if you kind of consider the full 
combination of these things, you could have you know a million plus time domain simulations that you need to run. And so finding tractable ways of narrowing down that probabilistic design space so you can capture the overall you know, ultimate fatigue loads uh, reliably is, is, is quite a challenge. So the, the Department of Energy, a wind energy program, uh, uh, heavily involved with, uh, with NREL is, is really developing a suite of tools uh, to support the design of floating wind uh, systems. These kind of tools you kind of think of in terms of, you know, whether they apply to turbines themselves in isolation or full uh, wind plants, and then also from a range of model fidelity. So at the lowest uh, fidelity, uh, we have tools that basically run practically instantaneously, things that you can run, you know, millions of combinations in, in very little time. Uh, this is a way to explore uh, the design space of the system. You know, what's my general configuration of my turbine or my plant? At the highest fidelity level, what we're really trying to do is resolve as much physics as we can to really understand uh, the problem. Uh, so really you're trying to understand the physical interaction, say, of the turbine uh, and its surrounding environment, both of them at the turbine and plant level. And that's with our SOFA and Exawind platforms. And actually Mike Sprague led a, led a webinar a couple months ago on, on these topics. Uh, so sitting in the middle is is engineering tools uh, really meant for detailed design applications, so open fast for uh, the turbine itself, and then tools like Fast Farm and Wind SE for analysis of turbines at the farm level. So these tools can effectively run real time, uh, such that you can still, you know, still run hundreds of thousands of time domain simulations, but capture the main physics necessary to do actual structural design calculations with. Talk a little bit about open fast, because yeah, that, that's really our workhorse uh, simulation tool here. Uh, it's really trying to capture the coupled uh, aerodynamic structure and control the capability of, of these floating wind turbines. The main purpose is to run nonlinear time domain simulations. So we're trying to capture the aero uh, and hydrodynamic input to the, to the model and then the re reaction in terms of the structural response of the control system as well as how the mooring uh, or station keeping system behaves. So this is really meant for kind of detailed time domain loads analysis calculations, basically following what's required in international design standards. Another major and important feature of OpenFast is the ability to linearize the models. So the underlying equations themselves are nonlinear, but if you can linearize them, then you can really understand uh, what this what what the physics really means. And so the linear, linearization feature is really important to um, calculate things like eigen solution. That means calculating. Uh, the natural frequencies, the load shapes, and, and damping at various modes of operation. Uh, linear models are great for control design applications, as well as analyzing things like instabilities. Uh, because engineering models themselves don't fully resolve all physics, we had to make some simplified assumptions uh, to make them uh, efficient enough to run the full load speed. Uh, verification and validation of these tools is, is highly important. And so, as I mentioned earlier, what we really do is, is a combination of uh, verification uh, and validation. Uh, verification, by that, we really mean comparing the model with some underlying mathematical model. And we often do this by basically comparing one, one model against another of similar levels of fidelity. Uh, that tells us that the software has been implemented properly, as we expect. Uh, but validation, of course, is also very critical. That, that's really saying, does our model really represent the reality of interest that we're considering? We do that through a combination of analysis uh, against, uh, of course, real-world test data, whether that's some model-scale experiment in, a, say, a wave basin or a full-scale uh, operational turbine. We also use uh, high-fidelity models like the SOFA and XLM tools uh, to do validation of our lower models and try to inform the development of these tools. And, of course, to use those tools in their technology development. But this slide summarizes some of the major accomplishments that we, we've had over the years, um, uh, particularly in the area of engineering modeling. And so first of all, OpenFast is used worldwide uh, to design uh, systems, uh, not only uh, in the research and academia communities, but also in industry. In fact, 80% uh, of the first pre-commercial prototypes in floating wind uh, were actually designed uh, with support from OpenFast. These are some of the examples shown here. Another major accomplishment is NREL's led this uh, international uh, codes comparison collaboration, what's known as OC3, 4, 5, and now 6, uh, really leading the international community in the verification and validation of these tools. And that's happened since 2005. Uh, finally, uh, most recently, NREL has now developed basically new capability, which for the first time ever will enable us to do full loads calculations of turbines in wind farms. So this is showing actually not a, not a flowing case, this is a flowing complex terrain, but showing basically the streak lines of flow 
uh, through the wind farm. So these are simulations now we can do at practically real time to do loads calculations of, of turbines and farms. Uh, final couple slides, I'll just summarize some of the key uh, developments that are ongoing uh, now and sort of recent accomplishments. Uh, so first of all, and actually this was presented at the last webinar, but we've introduced a new uh, free wake vortex model to capture uh, better, better capture the aerodynamic interaction of the rotor with its near wake. This is quite important for floating wind uh, because of the floater platform induced motion of the rotor. Another area that we've been working on uh, is in the area of improving fast farm at high thrust conditions. Uh, the current model in fast farm is quite robust for low thrust cases where basically momentum theory applies. But in high thrust cases, uh, effectively momentum theory breaks down uh, and the wake uh, expands, but then uh, Quite, quite quickly. And so we've been developing a model based on basically high fidelity uh, exit wind simulations that allow us to understand what happens there in the, in the high thrust conditions better in former engineering models. Another example is from our high fidelity modeling group uh, where they've been using or upgrading exit wind recently to study the turbulence induced by uh, wave fields. And this may impact, of course, uh, how we do fatigue analysis of uh, floating offshore turbines. Another major area that we, we focus on is really improving the models to better support specific technology uh, enhancements. Uh, one area is, uh, is we've done in partnership with uh, Steesdale Offshore Technology with their touches bar design, making sure our tools can really capture the highly compliant nature of these systems. So we have uh, quite slender uh, structures uh, here, as well as things like uh, pre-tension cables and hanging bowel systems that we want to make sure we can capture, of course, the structural loads and then in those components. Historically, we always modeled the floater as a rigid body. Uh, that really doesn't apply to these uh, next generation technologies that are, that are much more uh, compliant. And so that, that's been a great partnership and a highly advanced capability and open fast tool. Another example is a partnership we had with uh, Makani. Uh, this one, this was a project fully actually funded by Makani uh, to basically just support the development of a tool like FAST that we actually called Kite Fast for airborne uh, floating wind systems. And so this tool uh, is now publicly available to the community to support airborne technology development. Final example I'll show, uh, this is uh, from Matt Hall at NREL, who's leading an effort to do uh, basically the development of floating technologies that have shared uh, mooring systems. So here, uh, the turbines interact, not just because of wakes that may come by uh, and controls that may be talking to each other, but also directly through the mooring connections. And so we've been uh, now making improvements, say, to fast farm to be able to model this and developing te design techniques uh, to analyze uh, these types of unique floating concepts. Final slide here is on verification and validation. And this is just showing a couple of examples uh, uh, recently that we've been addressing. One was a partnership we had with uh, Siemens uh, when they you know, used the highly instrumented uh, 2.3 megawatt turbine with air elastic at the tethered blades and nice inflow measurements as well. And we used that to validate our new capability in FAST called Beamdyne uh, to do uh, air elastic calculations for these highly flexible blades. And this is showing sort of the mean uh, plus or minus one standard deviation across a thousand uh, uh, time series cases uh, and showing we, we match quite well to the experimental data. Now, finally, uh, Amy leads a project actually uh, within OC6 uh, um, and, and IEA Task 30 that's really focused on improving our understanding and the ability to model of the say loading of the towers for floating wind systems. Uh, historically in OC5, we found actually quite consistent under prediction across a range of uh, modeling tools for a range of load cases as well, basically a 20% under prediction of ultimate and fatigue loads. We found out this was basically caused by a resonance excitation of from hydrodynamic loading that we weren't properly capturing in our model. And now with an OC6, we're actively working to resolve that. So our models can predict this better in the future. Uh, so with that, I'll pass control now to Garrett. Thank you, Jason. this and now it's not working.
Garrett, I can Appreciate, go ahead. Uh, the is Garrett Barton. Can see it now. Yep. Hi, my name is uh, Garrett Porter. I've been in NREL about three and a half years, having previously spent time at Sandia National Labs in the aerospace industry. I lead the system engineering for wind research portfolio. So I'd like to continue on the, the theme of the talk of moving towards cost competitive commercial floating wind energy. And I'm gonna talk about getting there through systems engineering and optimization. So I'd like to take a step back at first and, and look at the current design paradigm for offshore wind plants. I'm gonna call it the iterative design paradigm. It really reflects the current market reality where each company that's involved uses its specialized expertise and multiple companies have to come together to make a plant a reality. You have your OEM, which designs the turbine. Another company will design the substructure. The two have to come together and iterate on a controller that minimizes the loads and maximizes the power. Once that product is refined, they hand it over to a developer who owns uh, the array layout, uh, the logistics of your balance of plant, assembly, installations, operations and maintenance, that sort of thing. Now, again, you, this reflects the current market reality, which you can't really knock too much. Uh, offshore wind has been quite successful over the past 20 years or so. It's grown tremendously. However, we think that this approach, when applied to floating, will give you solutions that work, just not necessarily that are cost competitive. So maybe to show this integrated paradigm at work, I'll take a look at uh, the recent or kind of the only uh, somewhat commercial wind offshore wind project here in the US, the Block Island Wind Farm uh, installed off of Rhode Island. It was installed by then uh, Deepwater Wind, now uh, part of Worstead. And there were many suppliers. Your turbine was supplied by GE. They had their own network of subcontractors. There's a little diagram there on the drivetrain components and you can't read it, but uh, lots of other contractors are listed. The blades were from LM. Uh, the jacket was made by uh, Gulf Island Fabrication. The cables were supplied by somebody else and other companies owned the vessels. Deepwater Wind was responsible for getting all of these players together to make one cohesive project but they didn't possess the final design authority over everything. If you compare that to uh, the aerospace industry where wind is often considered a, a younger cousin of sorts, uh, one recent uh, big introduction in, in aerospace was the Boeing 787, although maybe not so recent anymore. Certainly also a complex system with many subcontractors responsible for executing on, on different components. Boeing, however, is the, the prime systems uh, contractor. They retain ultimate design authority and is the prime systems integrator over everything. Since they own the whole design, they can trade off and make changes to one component that uh, for the good of the system. That's something we're not yet able to do uh, for a full wind plant. So why won't iterative, this iterative paradigm cut it for floating? Well, Jason already explained to you how complex the floating environment is in terms of the physics. I would say that as engineers, we typically want to understand that environment thoroughly and design a product meant to operate in that environment. Uh, but even if you're wildly successful at that, uh, your turbine costs, uh, your turbo capital costs are really only a, a small fraction of the lifetime cost, the lifetime levelized cost of energy, LCOE. A lot of other costs is buried in the additional complexity of your logistics, balance of plant, operation maintenance, financing, now, all these do, are tied in certainly to the, your engineering choices, but you really need a systems approach in order to reflect that coupling and, and tackle the whole balance sheet at once. So we, we would propose then an, an integrated approach through multidisciplinary analysis and optimization, MDAO. We think this is the most promising pathway to getting to cost competitive floating wind. And then uh, concept, you take a, a given innovation, which could be, you know, for a specific component, a logistic, really anything, and you would insert that into a, a big framework that has all your engineering and all your costs represented together, and that are uh, moreover cap, uh, coupled with one another, which is in some ways the hardest thing to do. From there, you apply analyses that can vary from simple parametric sweeps or sensitivity studies to a little bit more wonky mathematical approaches that uh, do optimization in the presence of uncertainty. And in the end, you've derived the cost benefit trade-offs or the levelized cost of energy impact 
for a given innovation on the whole system. And this way you can start to evaluate which pathways or innovations make the most sense. So our thoughts and our approach is to use this uh, type of uh, tool and technique to move from these, uh, say, more arctic floating platform uh, geometries, which Amy described, uh, that were borrowed mostly from oil and gas into something that's a little bit more innovative, a little bit uh, more systems aware. Uh, some attempts at that are shown on the right, and there are many ideas out there. Uh, we, not all of these will be successful. We don't know which ones are going to win out. Um, it's going to be a combination of engineering and market reasons. But we'd like to uh, build the tools to ease that transition as much as possible. Now, it's also easy to think that um, all you have to do is build the, the Uber, the ultimate uh, systems framework here, and click optimize, and you're done. But that's actually not how it works. There's actually a lot that we think of the trade space, so this is the entire uh, space of possible designs, and we there's you know things that make sense and things that don't make sense. You can think of maybe the area of cost competitive floating wind systems at, as, as a corner of this trade space, it's shown here on the bottom. So we want to narrow from the yellow circle to the dark blue circle, and there's a few ways we, we go through that. First, there are standards and regulations that get applied. We also have lessons learned from uh, experience, and uh, this is could be a floating prototype, could be oil and gas. Then only after that is when you start to apply your optimization to squeeze out the last iota of performance and cost uh, from your system. See, when it comes to standards, I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, both Jason and Amy mentioned them briefly. Uh, there are no formal standards yet for floating wind. Uh, we're moving in that direction, but it takes a long time. Currently, what we have is the force of guidelines or recommendations. For the lessons learned, uh, I will talk about those just briefly. And these are some a list of some of the concepts or ideas that we have in mind that are borrowed from experience from prior projects and that we know will lead to a cost competitive solution. So uh, I'll talk about some of these, not all of them. Uh, don't quite have the time budget today, but all of these could have a, their entire presentation of their own. Now, the, ideally, we like to ingest these or insert these into our design framework, and that's easier for some of them uh, more than others. So really what that means is the engineer and the model have to work closely together. It is a cooperation and collaboration between the two. That's another key point I want to make is just because you can do fancy optimization that doesn't remove the value of the engineer from the process. OK, so with that soapbox message aside, let's dive into to some of these. Uh, so let's first take a think about assembly. Well, for instance, what would make sense for a floating turbine uh, to make it easy to assemble and cheap to assemble? Shallow drafts, so this is the the depth of the, of the substructure to, as ex, extends into the water column. If it's more shallow, it can uh, be uh, easily assembled at ports or at Quayside, and also go into a lot of different ports around the world, uh, which is uh, another uh, listing on our, our key learnings. It also means that if you can do assembly at the port, you could use land-based crawler cranes instead of specialized offshore cranes, which are bigger and, and, have, and can lift heavier items, but they're much more expensive and it requires labor at sea. Uh, to further alleviate your crane requirements, you can see some designs here on the right have off-center turbines. And one of the reasons for this is now it requires a shorter boom length and smaller counterweight on your, on your land-based crane to assemble. Going on to uh, from assembly to installation, if you are able to assemble at the port, your full turbine and floater, you're, you'd be able to tow it out directly to site. We think that would certainly be the cheapest option as opposed to, again, labor at sea and specialized vessels at sea. If turbines could be transported horizontally as that uh, diagram shows or that image shows, it would certainly open up new possibilities and excite the spar enthusiasts. Uh, but that is a new load case on the drivetrain and the bearings that really hasn't been examined or, or considered yet by the OEMs, so we're not quite ready for that, um, but who knows, maybe it could come. What, once you've towed it out, now you have to install and get the turbines uh, set up on station. Uh, that can also take some specialized vessels, especially around moorings and anchors, 
One idea from DMVGL is to include uh, winches on the platform or at least allow them to be easily attached. That could might eliminate some of the time for, again, uh, specialized vessels. Gravity anchors shown there on the top right are also gaining popularity, especially for some of the totter mooring ideas or semi top mooring ideas. Uh, again, there's very little seabed prep and, and anchor uh, deployment that would be re required there. Finally, I should mention the Stiesel Tetris bar, which Jason talked about in depth. I'll just note that it's a transformer of sorts, and that I mean uh, it has a, it looks like a semi-submersible with a very shallow draft during tow out. Then once it gets on station, it drops a ballast to gain some stability, but it's also a very easy installation step, and it looks more like a spar when in operation. So we think there are a lot of good merits there um, in, in that concept. Okay, so now I finally made it to the to the final narrowing of the trade space to uh, applying optimization. So we'll talk about that now. Now it's probably very easy to to think about uh, optimization as a way to do cost reduction. Most folks uh, jump to the area of weight reduction as that pathway, and pretty much any component you can consider on the turbine has a pathway to weight reduction. Uh, oftentimes you could just substitute in a new material like carbon fiber or move to something like superconducting generators, which has a lot of nice scaling capabilities. Two-bladed downwind rotors, uh, much, much, much more lightweight, or something more radical like generative designs with additive manufacturing or a complete uh, concept change as kind of showed there on, on the top left. Now, each of these would essentially require fewer kilograms, but might be more expensive per kilogram as you introduce a new innovation. It's very difficult for the for a human brain to wrap around um, what makes sense, how to do all those system trade-offs. This goes back to the need for an integrated design paradigm. So I would say that this isn't something that is um, that I'm saying is completely novel. Folks are doing this. You all d dive into literature and find many examples in wind. Uh, even floating offshore wind where folks are trying systems optimization. We just haven't yet hit the bar of doing full floating turbine and platform as a systems optimization. Uh, here are some examples where optimization has been applied. The 15 megawatt reference wind turbine, many uh, components were designed with optimization, but not the, the floating substructure together with the turbine. Our own Matt Hall had some, has some nice papers in his publication history of, of doing something similar, but again, it was mostly focused on the platform. And our own John Yasa was recently uh, involved in a paper, had some really uh, nice takes and, and thoughts on how to do SPAR optimization. And you can see some very non-standard designs coming out uh, of the optimization process, things that the engineer might have thought of by themselves. So how are we gonna get there? Well, uh, this, I'll just wrap up with this message. We've, uh, both Jason and Amy have also talked about Atlantis, this idea, this project from RPE to do controls co-design, where you design the, the geometry, the architecture at the same time as the controller, as opposed to leaving the controller for the end. So we think that is a great pathway. And in order to enable that, we're gonna do a multi-fidelity approach since the floating uh, environment is so complex and the numerics are going to be so complex, we kind of have to chip away at it through a multi-fidelity approach. So we're going to bring together wisdom and open fast two common NREL tools. The idea being wisdom is a good design tool, um, but not a but too low fidelity to handle floating. Open fast is a great analysis tool, but it was never meant to be a systems optimization design tool. So we're going to combine those together and use the best of both worlds. Uh, that's it for me. So I'd like to turn it over now to Sanu Sirnavas to discuss how we go this conceptual design approach to the practicality of, of real-world design. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. I'm going to talk about design, and let me share my screen here. All right, so uh, Amy talked about. Um, Sorry, know, the Sue, we're still seeing Garrett's screen right now. Garrett's screen, yeah. Um, All right. Not seeing anything shared from you yet. Disappeared, but not seeing anything from you. 
Thought I was sharing my screen. All right, is that coming through? Yep, thanks. All right, thanks for uh, keeping me straight, Amy. Uh, Amy talked about uh, general resources and uh, and why we should do uh, floating wind. Uh, Jason came in and talked about you know the physics and all the complexity that uh, that has to be modeled, and then we had Garrett talking about optimization and tools in general. I'm going to talk about design. So we have we have the resource, we have the physics, uh, we have the tools. Now design is a little different in the sense that we have to use these tools and uh, uh, to um, uh, to produce uh, platforms that we can install uh, in, in the water. So one of the things that uh, Amy talked about, and so did uh, uh, Jason and uh, and Garrett. Uh, that we have borrowed a lot of technology from oil and gas. Uh, here you see that there is a oil and gas uh, uh, drilling and uh, production platform, which is huge. Uh, usually the oil and gas uh, fields are um, designed and developed, you know, as one-offs. Uh, they don't really mass produce them. Uh, so uh, there is really no uh, automation in the process. And, and in a sense, then this becomes very expensive. Uh, uh, if we use technologies coming from oil and gas and, uh, and and on top of that is also bulky. So we need to come up with new ways of of doing things. Um, so one of the things that uh, uh, I started with uh, in, in the beginning, and I'm only going to talk about one design here, although the tools and uh, and things that uh, Jason and Garrett talked about, you know, is, is agnostic and can be used for uh, any floating structures. Uh, there are mainly three floating uh, structures. You, you could you could think of them as pars, as uh, semis, and as TLPs, and then variations of that, right? And people are always coming up with more imaginary ideas and wacky designs uh, that that we have to uh, uh, that the tools have to adapt to, right? Uh, and in in this specific instance that I'm talking about, the spider float, you know, we're only going to consider the floating structure substructure design and not the, um, uh, the the turbine itself, right? Because that's constrained by the manufacturer. So uh, in 2017, uh, we started this LDRD and uh, to look at innovative floating structures, and we wanted to go in with an open uh, 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 open idea in the sense that we can uh, come up with something new, think outside the box. Uh, but one of the things that we knew in uh, 2017 uh, that the uh, uh, cost of uh, the LCOE needed to be about 15 cents a kilowatt hour, as you can see on this uh, on this slide here. Uh, this is for a semi, and the cost of the substructure was going to be about 10.72 million. So, so we kind of had this constraint and wanted to either meet this or beat this at least in 2018. And we started this project in 2017. So, uh, we wanted to come up with a floating substructure design and uh, and have a um, functional requirements that we came up with that we wanted to uh, address. Uh, there were a total of 16 of them, uh, but we mainly wanted to concentrate on the first few here, uh, which is highlighted in red. Uh, I talked about the 15 cents a kilowatt hour for the LCOE, and also if you look at uh, the uh, ports, you know, where we can actually build and assemble these things, uh, we wanted to keep the draft to a very shallow, um, uh, shallow draft, about 14 meters, uh, so that we can actually do all the pre-commissioning and everything on the on the key side before taking it off. It, uh, uh, at site, and we also wanted to use off-the-shelf components. You know, we didn't want any special components because that'll just increase the cost. Uh, so the water depth we considered was about 60 meters and beyond. Uh, anything below that, you know, you could use a, uh, a fixed bottom uh, uh, structure. So we wanted to concentrate on 60 meters and above. Uh, the rest of the uh, functional requirements we have here. Uh, design life of 25 years, you know, and I talked a little bit about pitch here, six degrees, but really, you know, it could bo it could go more than that. But we kind of wanted to limit, you know, the pitch in, in extreme conditions to about six degrees. Uh, we also wanted to have station keeping redundancy. What that means is, you know, we wanted to have uh, additional mooring lines. Uh, if one mooring line does fail, you know, the system is still uh, uh, um, uh, still still there. 
Um, and and the other big thing is also simple decommissioning, right? We didn't want uh, to to have very complex uh, heavy vessels, uh, heavy lift vessels out there to do the decommissioning or also the installing. So all this plays into trying to lower the LCOE. Uh, and the other big thing that we wanted to do that uh, that should be highlighted in red here is uh, minimize the wave loads. Uh, and if we minimize the wave loads, then we can minimize uh, the amount of uh, steel or material that we need uh, on the on the floating structure itself. So having these functional requirements, uh, we started looking at different concepts. Uh, you know, what can we do to uh, 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 to come up with a, a innovative idea? You know, and what kind of materials we can use, right? So. You know, there are all kinds of materials you can use. Con there's concrete, there's steel, there's fiberglass, you know, composites uh, that can go into uh, building a uh, floating system. So we started looking, exploring at, at the materials and also different designs and how to capture, you know, maybe added mass and, and different things uh, and, and also to, to reduce the, uh, the loads being transmitted to the strength, uh, to the structure, to the central structure. And um, and these are some of the ideas that we came up with. Uh, we have a, a barge here. This is all made of concrete. Uh, and I wanted to grab some water in the uh, in the space here so we can you know have some uh, added mass uh, that we have to move move about and, and reduce the heave. And then uh, the, this idea here uh, is about um, uh, having a. a, a, a bunch of uh, connections here. There are moment free connections and also a retractable ballast. Uh, and, and this is just a variation of that, you know, with some buoyancy cans on the side here and another variation of that. So we, we, we looked at all of these and we finally concluded that uh, uh, what we really uh, um, wanted to do was incorporate some of the ideas that we were considering the concept and we came up with this innovative concept called spider float. Now, uh, I'm going to go through this in a little bit of detail. Sorry. All right. I'm going to go back. There we go. Um, so we wanted to have moment free connections so that we can reduce the load being transmitted to the central. And if you look at these uh, schematic that we have here, uh, we uh, we said, OK, we're going to make uh, 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 joints here, universal joints, you know, that connects the buoyancy cans, which is going to uh, provide the buoyancy that's needed. We have a central column here and a couple of there's, there's arms. There are three arms here that you can see. There's one on the back here. So we have we have the arms here. Uh, and, and these are moment free connections uh, uh, here and here. So these cans, in fact, you know, they can flex uh, as the waves come in and, and go. Uh, so we also wanted to use different kind of materials. You know, we wanted to keep the heavy materials at the bottom and we wanted to keep the light materials, you know, at the top. So I call this a material for purpose. And so what we ended up doing was we said we're going to make uh, these cans out of fiberglass and then we're going to make these uh, uh, the central column here and, and, and this legs here uh, using concrete because we want the heavy stuff to be in the bottom and the light stuff to be the, to be at the top. So. So this is a uh, this design. Finally, we called it spider float because it kind of looks like a spider in some ways. <laughs> and as I said earlier, you know, we have constrained by what we were going to do at the top. So we only constrained on the platform here. And we also considered retractable ballast. Uh, uh, the design that we're considering now does not have a retractable ballast, but uh, but this is an option that we can add to it uh, to to get better stability here. Um, so here is a simulation that we did in uh, in, in ANSYS. Uh, a part of the, I'll get to why why we're using different tool sets to open fast uh, in a bit here. Uh, but what we wanted to do but uh, is to is to have a lightweight design and we wanted structural compliance. So we wanted the cans to move, and we wanted um, uh, we wanted to have all these moment free connections. And and what this what this is is really, you know, if you look at this picture here, you know, if you have a hurricane coming through and you see these palm trees, you know, they're flexing. Uh, the more flex you have, you know, they can, uh, you can, you can actually come up with lighter uh, design, and that's what we wanted to do. Um, so now we have the the design sort of uh, uh, figured out, and we really know what we wanted from the uh, functional requirements we had, uh, and we have the simulations done. 
uh, one of the other things that needs to be done in any design is you have to go into a model base and you got to actually test this in a model scale to see how you know you actually performs in, a, in an actual model scale you know and compare that back to your simulation and adapt your simulation tools you know to to match your model test so matt hall here has done this uh, hybrid testing uh, that's uh, that's come on board and he's going to help uh, help us uh, move this along uh, to do a model test you know probably at a 150 scale uh, at one of the model basins here. And uh, so here we have a hybrid simulation system where we, we have the platform here. Of course, these are not individual cans. Now they're all uh, as one big can in the model test. And we have this optional thing for uh, adjusted, you know, adjustable ballast here so that we can try different things if we want to go that route. Uh, this is being uh, in the process uh, 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 of being done. Uh, we haven't really got there yet, but uh, we'll be doing this model test soon. So here's a detail of uh, the uh, the LDRE itself, the Spider Float, um, and uh, we applied for an ARPA E pro, uh, project, and uh, we got awarded. Amy talked about this earlier. Uh, it's called US Float, uh, and US Float is really a combination of Spider Float uh, plus the DTU 10 megawatt machine. And uh, I talked about this a little bit. Uh, earlier about the buoyancy cans being made of fiberglass and we wanted to make them at factory or on site so that we can you know uh, easily produce them uh, and uh, and have it be cost effective and here are the connections that i talked about earlier where we wanted to have moment free connections so these cans can really move and we also wanted to have uh, moment free connections on the arm so they can also move sideways and up and down and we have these cables coming down uh, connecting to the to the arms and we have actuators here that we can control the tensions of these uh, uh, of these cables, you know, um, and uh, these uh, these arms now they they can be the built you know on site or they can be uh, done at the factory as well and brought in and assembled. Um, and uh, talked about the cables. Uh, that's how we're going to control the tension on these arms. And the central column is also going to be of concrete and and that can be done on site. So a lot of the uh, cost uh, savings here is really going to come from uh, either uh, uh, building a lot of these components in factory and assembling them at port, or actually pouring them out. Uh, you know, since we are using concrete, you know, using using the port itself and and uh, making the pieces uh, on site. So here's an animation of uh, of the system, uh, complete system. I'm going to move this forward a little bit because uh, it takes a little while to run, uh, and and we modeled this in OrcaFlex, and part of the reason we did this is because uh, OpenFast, as it stands right now, uh, uh, does not have the capability to do multi-body uh, 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 modeling uh, with the flexible cans we have and the flexible arms we have. Uh, we don't have the capability to do uh, the cables with active tensioning and also joint damping, which is not available in, in uh, OrcaFlex uh, uh, as well, uh, and our tapered buoyancy cans, which can be done in OrcaFlex, uh, and, um, and linearization, right? So part of the reason we are using uh, OrcaFlex at this time is because these capabilities are available in, in OrcaFlex, but OrcaFlex is not able to do uh, linearization, which is needed for uh, control code design as, uh, you know, as what we need uh, in ARPA-E. Uh, Atlantis program. And uh, I wanted to say that a lot of the work, uh, uh, although we're doing it in OrcaFlex, uh, as uh, Jason talked about and as um, uh, Garrett talked about, a lot of these capabilities are being added to uh, OpenFast. And we would be, you know, we will be moving to uh, OpenFast uh, in the future here uh, to do uh, uh, the US float um, uh, CCD design using OpenFast. So I just wanted to leave one thing with uh, with the audience here. And um, you know, Amy talked about market resource and, and what's available and uh, and how this uh, uh, can be, you know, we need designs to to uh, uh, designs to 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 place in this market to so. So we have designs and people are coming up with wacky designs. You know, uh, the, the US float is kind of a wacky design in some ways. And uh, uh, wacky designs need new physics. 
and and so new physics needs to be added to to open fast and then what happens is you know we need to have the physics uh, uh, being added to the simulation tool and the simulation tool you know to be applied to the design this is an iterative process it's not a a, a process where like Garrett was saying you know you press a button and, and you get an optimized solution you know it is really iterative uh, design, you know, as new wacky designs come into place and and physics need to be solved and the physics need to be added to the simulation tool and the simulation tool can be used in the design. And so this is an iterative process and I want to leave everyone with that. And uh, that's all I had really. Thank you. I hope that was 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Sanu. And thanks, Garrett. And thanks, Jason. Um, for, for your presentations. That was all really great. Um, I'll just remind people that there is a chat function um, associated with this webinar that you can be posting your questions in. Uh, a few people have done that, but um, just encourage more people to do that if you like. So there should be like a little bubble looking thing um, at, at the top to be able to, uh, that you can click on to enter some questions. So for the next, 15 minutes approximately. We're going to go through some question and answers. Um, first, trying to address any that are, are being posted in the chat area. And then um, if we have some extra time, we can, can look at some additional ones as well. Um, so based on the ones in the chat, I think maybe we'll go to this one first that I think, uh, Jason, I'd like you to see if you, you'd like to answer. Uh, and the question is, what is the level of error in these models? Or given the amount of variables, do you expect a certain percent of installed turbines to not produce or break? Uh, does this factor into commercialization? Yeah, that, that, that's really a great question. I would say it's kind of fundamental to the work we do. So we don't just do the tool development. We also do a lot of work on verification and validation. I would say the answer is not completely straightforward. I can't just say it's 20 percent or, or, or whatever, because it certainly depends on many, many things. Um, just a couple comments. I'll say uh, certainly the because we know there is uncertainty that that can never fully be eliminated. Obviously, we will make improvements over time, um, but because we will never fully make perfect models, there there is some built-in safety into the design. Uh, so the the, sta the standards require a, basically a, a a load safety factor. Uh, that's the typical value is one point three five. Um, we typically assume about half of that comes from uncertainty in numerical modeling and about another half comes from uncertainty in your environment in which you operate your turbine in. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a general, general rule of thumb that we use. Uh, but then if you kind of, kind of, kind of talk about specifics, uh, certainly um, things we do quite well, structural dynamics tends to be quite well captured within the model. I think the physics are well known and as long as you have the material properties known that, that that's quite good. Uh, Hydrodynamics we have quite quite good, I would say, for say like direct wave excitation, uh, first order wave excitation of the model. Things like not nonlinear wave excitation, you know, some in different frequencies, we, we tend to have a harder time with. And then I think the biggest source of uncertainty in any any of these models is really on the aerodynamic side. Uh, highly nonlinear, uh, highly challenging when you talk about large rotors, you know, in, in the in the atmosphere. Atmosphere boundary layer, and so the aerodynamic uncertainty is the, probably the biggest source, uh, and often one we focus on. Great, thanks, Jason. And if any of the speakers ever want to chime in, in addition, please just go ahead. Um, Sanu, we're still seeing your slides. I don't know if you were trying to share still, but um, just so you know. Um, okay, the the next question actually I was going to um, direct at Sanu. Um, the question is, how is the design process impacted when designing larger systems with 15 to 20 megawatt wind turbines, if it is, or is it just a straightforward upscale? Yeah. Foam itself, uh, 15 is not really that big of a deal, right? Uh, you just need to make it a little bigger. So in the US float system that uh, uh, that we have designed, it's actually sort of modular in some sense that you could um, uh, scale anything from six megawatt up to 20 megawatt, you know, and the incremental cost factor is not uh, it's not that big. So let's say, you know, for example, if you're going from a 10 to a 15, uh, the platform cost 
uh, would be a lot smaller uh, than uh, than than the than let's say the turbine cost, for example. I, I may want to add that. Um, uh, Garrett can step in too. I may want to add that uh, if you simply take a take a, a smaller turbine and scale it up, generally the rule of thumb you say uh, you know the mass would go as the cube. Uh, and that's basically the cost and, and power will go with a square uh, of, of the, say, the rotor diameter or length scale. And, and so you can't really solve that by scaling directly. Eventually, you're going to hit, hit a limit where you, you're basically building bigger is more expensive. And so there's definitely lots of technology innovation that goes with building uh, bigger systems. And then, as I mentioned in my presentation as well, large rotor, uh, large rotors introduce quite a number of, of unique challenges that large spatial temporal variability of the wind across the rotor as well as um, because you're trying to eliminate that square cube law by making it lighter, more flexible, a lot of your elastic challenges as well. The only th thing I would add is, um, you know, your computer and your design found a, a check that power or wearing some, you know, just can't be manufactured today. So now you have to um, either, you know, invent some new manufacturing method or, or put, put in an additional constraint, which then has other system impacts. So um, maybe for small steps, yeah, scaling works, but for big steps, chances are you're going to run into some sort of constraint like that. So those are really constraints on, on the turbine, right, and the blades and whatnot. Yeah, I think there's also a constraint that I've I've heard about on, on moorings. Um, again, as the system, the turbine size grows, again, your your support structure will grow in size too. There's constraints on yeah, whether facilities are able to produce the size of structures needed to support those larger turbines. And for moorings, from what I understand, you can get to be such a, a long, lengthy, heavy mooring line at these larger scales that that can actually um, uh, max out the capabilities we have right now in terms of the installation vessels to to lay down those moorings. So I think there's yeah there's multiple areas where we we, that we might have that effect. Um, I, the uh, next question I'm not sure if the the next three questions we have and now we have a fourth. Um, but the next three I'm not sure if the panel is the best for for answering. But I'll, I think I'll just pose this this one just in case. Um, the question is, do you envision some acoustic constraints offshore as onshore? And will any changes or relaxation of con acoustic constraints allow you to increase energy production and reduce LCOE? Um, so Jason, I thought maybe you might be able to, to take that, if you, if you like. <laughs> yeah, well, certainly, um, you know, big challenge with acoustics is the noise, noise uh, emission. Uh, when, you, when you talk about certainly far offshore that you can certainly say that's likely less of an less, less of an issue which means you can tend to push up your tip speed ratio uh and your and your blade tip speeds um which means you can go to a you know lower solidity rotor uh in general um uh, I, I, that's about all i have to say yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just add that um yeah so so Relaxing acoustic constraints may get you to a, uh, you think you might be able to get to a higher tip speed, but offshore there's also a leading edge erosion uh, issue that can come into play, and that can sometimes drive your, your max tip speed. So just because you don't have um, the acoustics issues doesn't mean you can, you have uh, free free reign to, to go as fast as possible. Yeah, thanks. And I mean, I don't think the question's directed in this way, but there is acoustic constraints also on the installation process offshore, and, and that's another um, thing we're looking at for innovative designs. I think this is more problematic on the fixed bottom rather than floating, but actually installing the system itself, pile driving down in the seabed, things like that, doing work in the ocean um, has an effect acoustically on the, the oceanographic uh, animals. Um, and the other two questions were related to the electrical system, which, um, yeah, the, the speakers here on this panel, I don't think are, the, are really the appropriate ones, unfortunately, to answer that question. One was related to whether we're looking at transmission challenges associated with floating offshore wind. And another is if the offshore electrical collection system for floating wind is straightforward or a solved issue. 
Um, I, I will just from myself mention, and I, I can let others um, interject if they do have anything to say on this. I, I know this is an area that we're working on in terms of you know, the offshore wind integration into the, the US uh, grid. Um, as far as um, kind of the focus areas that we have in terms of the modeling and um, dynamics, there is an issue with the, um, for floating wind, um, the way that the power is transported is through a power cable for a fixed bottom offshore wind system um, that will uh, you know, be a very static cable, but for a floating wind system, it also needs to hang kind of similar to the mooring line, hang off the floating wind system. So there are challenges in modeling that, uh, or designing, sorry, that, that cable system that will take the energy from the floating platform into the grid infrastructure. So that, that is an ongoing challenge of trying to understand what the dynamics of these floating wind systems are and ensuring that we can create a cable design that can withstand the, 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 the motion characteristics. Yeah, Amy, the only thing I'll add is, and so like Amy said, that dynamic cables can be both a modeling and a maintenance challenge, but also floating uh, projects tend to be a little bit further from shore than, than fixed bottom. So in that sense, um, uh, you may, we, other folks at NREL are considering medium voltage or high voltage DC export cables and, and uh, collection systems. Um, uh, like Amy said, you know, the folks here on the panel, that's not really our area of expertise, but it's, it's definitely something to consider. I think once you get the, the energy on shore, you know, the electrons look the same as, as um, fixed bottom wind. So integrating into the grid isn't necessarily the challenge, it's just getting it onshore. Um, that, that is the bigger challenge. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, another question is, um, are there any issues with aeroelastic instabilities such as blade flutter with large rotor systems? Um, Jason, do you wanna maybe start that one off? Yeah, so, so certainly at, because you're trying to beat this square cube law, you try to make your systems generally uh, lighter and more flexible. And with that effectively means that you're likely approaching uh, flutter limits. So you wanna make sure that say, you know, your torsional, first torsional frequency is above the operational speed of the rotor, um, or if it's not, to make sure you, you don't rest on that frequency well. So this is a big reason why we focus on our modeling work, not just on time domain simulations, which of course is important to analyze these systems, but also focusing on linearization so we can properly predict natural frequencies in a range of conditions, and then also really focusing on um, elastically tailored blades, being able to model the, the torsion, uh, and of course, offsets of say mass and stiffness uh, from the you know say from the pitch axis, including uh, composite tailoring. So yeah, def definitely it's it, it's an issue. It's becoming more important as you get to larger systems, mostly because you're pushing them to be more flexible. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and we have another question: How is OpenFast multi-body dynamic solver being changed? model systems like the spider float and will a third party multi body solver be used so maybe sanu if you want to start with that and and jason sure. or garrett if you want to add in sure so um uh, so one of the biggest uh, challenges we had uh, uh, when we were uh, coming up with the idea for spider float is you know tools and and the tools were not there for us to really investigate um uh, uh, the flexibility of uh, of what we had in spite of load. So in the in the very beginning, the way we addressed it was, we said, okay, you know, we're just going to look at it like a fixed system for now because that's what we could do in fast, uh, and then uh, just get the turbine loads that we can from um, uh, from fast, and then impose that in an ANSYS model where you can do multi body, right? So there's always these these tools that are always lagging, uh, you know, what I call wacky designs. And uh, and so somehow you know you have to come up with a, a way to um, um, to to engineer it, and you could use you know tools like Fast, you know that is not there yet, but you can use other tools that that have some of the features you need, and then you know try to try to use them together until a tool you know is ready. And 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 uh, Jason is working on this, and so. Uh, that the WISE team is, and they're adding a lot of features of flexibility, multi-body cable, you know, cables with tensions and whatnot, which we'll eventually be able to use uh, with, uh, uh, with 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 spider float, and uh, and OrcaFlex, uh, on the other hand, uh, also has the turbine in, turbine in there, 
uh, right? So you could do uh, you could do multi-body with the cables and uh, uh, and the turbine, uh, but it has its own lack of features. You know, you can't do linearization that you need for uh, for a CCD approach that we need to do in in, um, in ARPA E. Um, so um, so you just need to find um, and and try to bridge the gap, and that's kind of what we did. And now we have. Uh, uh, let um, uh, the WISE team know these are the features we need, and uh, they're adding to, uh, uh, to, to OpenFast. So this is a cyclic process, right? Uh, Maybe I'll just add that uh, I mentioned the Steesdale project where we've added the ability to model uh, the substructure as, a, as basically a series of, of beam elements in various joint types. Um, so we got, we got, you know, we can re represent the arms, say, of the spider float as beams, and then we also have, we've introduced things like uh, you know, ball joints and universal joints between those beams, as well as pretension cable elements. And that, that gets most of the way there for the spider float. But the thing that's, that was still missing is the buoyancy cans, which uh, uh, are heavily nonlinear, as, as Sanu showed in his animation. They, they move a lot, and so we can't assume things that we've assumed in other models. And so uh, we're actually introducing that now uh, with our nonlinear solver called Mordine. Uh, Matt Hall is taking the lead on that. And so soon I think we'll be actually be able to model the spider float quite well. Uh, we chose not to use a, a third-party multi-body solver for this. Uh, uh, a big part, big reason for that is because uh, a lot of our focus is on, you know, full, uh, not just single turbines, but also full floating wind farms. And so having a, a multi-body solver would make that sort of coupled problem quite challenging. Uh, and so, but if we can control the coupling scheme and how it's solved, then it, it's it's easier if we do that our, ourselves. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think we are actually um, out of time and we're out of questions on the panel. I had some some stage, but I think since we've run out of time, maybe we should just close it there. And I, I'd just like to take the, the time to thank Alex and, and Nate for the introduction and, and organization of this webinar and to Jason, Garrett, and Sanu for their great presentations and their great discussions in the panel as well. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Alex posted, I think this will be, Alex, is this being um, shared, the recording of this, that people can download as well? Yes, um, it's on the Win Energy Science Leadership Series page, and I will go ahead and put the link in the chat box so everyone can look forward to the next topic in December. All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone.